currently in a fucked up 3.5 campaign. My DM is a pretty dope bitch, but the current cast of players leaves something to be desired. All are either first timers or folks who have only ever played 4th edition, so there is some system shock to get over. DM confides in me that I can make whatever build I want, since she will be protecting the newbies and throwing reasonably hard shit at me. So I decided to make a necromancer, specifically a hyper durable impossible to kill necromancer that will enable me to survive any insane shit the party, in its folly, drags me into. Decide to specialise in rays, so that I can hang in the background and let the new players enjoy the spotlight. I make judicious use of my spells like Ray of Enfablement and Clumsiness, which allows me to debuff like a boss and help the rest of the party shine. I slowly grow in power, jealousy hoarding as much magic as I can. The campaign progresses, and the other folk who initially formed unique snowflake Mary Sue characters are actually starting to work as a team, provide support for each other's abilities, and tackle things something akin to competence. And then they got greedy. We finally clear out the resistance of Atar, long abandoned during the previous war, at the behest of a powerful and wealthy fellow who had intended to use it for a way station for his caravans of trade goods. It was a relatively hard fight, ending with a rather masterful round of combat from our cleric, who murdered several high level combatants and their undead minions with a great sword and a nasty combination of touch spells. The party is dividing the loot and claiming bits of choice treasure when, finally, the pixie scion, don't ask, turns to my quiet, unassuming human necromancer and demands a slice of my loot, saying that I did nothing during the struggle to take the tower, so I didn't deserve a full share. Now, mind you, I had been reliably performing my job as party troubleshooter and general helper. I stripped away the arcane protection of the crazed mage in the basement. I had gotten us through several traps of arcane nature, used huge amounts of combat control magic during our struggle to the top level, and in the final struggle, I had turned the rather impressive stat lines of the leader into something you would expect from a first level gnome commoner. Needless to say, I was less than game for losing the small mountain of coins, scrolls and gems that my labours had earned me. After I politely refused to hand over the loot, the scion threatened me with force. A quick intervention by the NPC guide who had led us there averted anything serious. But I knew that my time with this group had finally come to an end. Our characters split up, vowing to all assemble the following day, to ensure the hand of the tower to our generous employer and to agree on loot distribution. The following morning, we all assembled in the entryway of the tower to show our boss what we had claimed for him. After around 10 minutes of real-time realerting, is that a verb? It should be and haggling, we received roughly 60% more than we had originally been promised, and now we were looking at a pretty sizeable chunk of cash. In fact, if all those gold pieces had been melted down, they could have formed the mass of a rather large sedan. I had hoped that this would slake the greed of the party, but now the rogue and sorcerer had sided with the pixie, and were insisting that I should only be awarded a cut of the payment from our employer and not a share of the swag we acquired when storming the tower itself. After again refusing, the pixie, in what I'm sure she thought was a stroke of brilliance, said that we could all work it out the next day, since we had to remain to guard the tower until the merchant guards and mercenaries arrived to take over stewardship. Spotting the obvious trap, I reasoned that this might actually be the best way for me to survive the inevitable assassination attempt. The rest of the party knew that I had a small sanctum somewhere, just six or seven rooms underneath the tavern in a small city that were so heavily warded with magic and traps that a demigod couldn't have entered if I hadn't wanted him to. So I had to put up a little fight until finally letting the pixie's words sway me into staying. I took a small cloistered bedroom near the top floor as my own and retired early. To sell the illusion of my death, I knew that I would need to make it believable to the party. My plan was to let them assassinate me then catch them talking about it to ensure no one could complain that I metagamed it. Then, I would unleash my fury, and it would truly be monstrous to behold. For a start, I warded the room with several castings of alarm. The door, the window, etc. Arcane lock in the door, fire trap on the lock itself, and then several castings of icicle, an explosive ruin or two, and a sepia snake sigil on my fake spellbook. 
These magics were relatively low powered, as I wanted their assassination to succeed, but I needed to give them the impression that I was cautious. The key to the plan was casting a clone, several heightened illusions and rope trick. When all things were in readiness, I popped off into my extra dimensional space and hoped that the party would fall for my plan. As within my pocket dimension, I would be unable to affect the world I was leaving behind, so I crossed my fingers and waited. I couldn't have planned it any better. It was like I had scripted the whole event. The sorcerer dispelled my magic on the door and several of my traps, while the pixie undid the others. Our DM was having psionics and magic work the effect of same energy, so that dispel psionics would function as dispel magic, and vice versa. The rogue proceeded through my traps with ease, snuck upon my sleeping body, and murdered me with a vicious sneak attack in my sleep. The contingency illusions kicked in. My inanimate clone twitched and coughed and breathed its last breath. They knew that I never went anywhere without my spell book, and when the rogue was paralysed by the book I had left, and the sorcerer cast read magic and confirmed it for arcane script, they clapped themselves in the back and went off to begin to divide up my share. The pixie made judicious use of psionic disintegrate to hide all the evidence in the room, and they considered themselves both clever and more daring than I. My look of shock and horror, numerous attempts at out of character pleading and some rather heated words with the DM sold the act. The looks in their faces when I teleported into the main hall the next morning were priceless. <laughs> <laughs> you know what is a fun class? In cantrics. The vast number of meta magic feats really give a player a lot to work with. The cooperative meta magic had also really helped the party. As I had chosen evocation as a banned skill to further restrict myself and ensure that our sorcerer and pixie, who was a kineticist, got to hold the nuke slot on our team. But it really shines when paired with a certain feat, arcane theist. This feat reduces meta magic spells, level adjustment by one, making things like empower cost plus one and quicken plus three. At 10th level, an encantrix gets an unlisted bonus that does effectively the same thing. They also can add meta magic to spells a few times a day without increasing the spell level. This was about to pay massive dividends. Even as the party was recovering from shock, I was casting. I had taken the time to hulk up in my room, prepping with all the usual goodies. Haste, improved mage armor, greater mirror image, blur. Really, all the goodies. I had almost cast improved invisibility, but I wanted them to see what their greed had caused. They asked for exactly what they were saying, and the DM turned to me. Throughout the whole campaign, I had been the voice of caution, reason, and moderation. I often backed off from the more dangerous activities, citing fear and self-preservation. My response? I looked supremely and unshakably confident. My hands clasped around meta magic rods. My first spell was devastating. After all, I did have them all surprised. And ranged touch attacks are easy when the target is flat footed. A chained, quickened, empowered split ray in variation seemed like a brilliant lead off. They looked confused. The casters in the party, also known as three out of five, not counting myself, looked confused. After all, the sorcerer and pixie had never paid too much attention to anything that didn't specifically mention damage dice. The clerk had mainly focused on buffing herself into your role as combat monster. The growing horror on their faces as the DM explained to them what level drain tasted of the sweet ambrosia. It was my heroine, my melange. I decided that the first to die would be my killer, the rogue. Now, our rogue was rather well built, with some gear I had shared with him, rogue's vest, etc, to improve his abilities. It also meant nothing now. People might argue that 3rd edition and 3.5 edition was wizard edition, oh my god, what the fuck, and some might argue that it was more balanced. All I know is that for someone who has played since he first found a torn player's handbook in the clearance bin during the 6th grade, Wizards can be a terrible thing. My use of a scroll of Mordekin's disjunction and the maximised reach shivering touch provided by haste proved that. The party was somewhere between fury and pure panic as initiative was rolled. The rogue was having trouble grappling with the fact that his character was currently a drooling mess on the floor, paralysed and unable to do anything but exhale. I was calm. I had, after all, brought my A-game to this scuffle. 
I won initiative with ease. Gloves of dexterity do more than just make you good with rays, after all. And slapped the cleric with an empowered twin ray of clumsiness. I told her that her character slumps to the floor before the DM did, while she responded with something akin to rapid onset rabies, and the DM looked at me like I was overstepping the line. I explained that 2d6 plus 10 times 1.5 dexterity drain is a bitch. Wanting to hold back any more really big spells unless a sorcerer or pixie threw something crazy at me, I slapped the fighter with a finger of death. Now, he would have had trouble with a DC 25 will save, even without the minus 9 penalty from intervention. As it was, his look of shock as his character simply stopped breathing tasted like aged wine. I regained my bloodlust. I knew the intoxicating power of player versus player combat and I readied my next action to counterspell the first thing the last two players might throw at me. They were rapidly exchanging words, but it didn't matter. There was blood in the water now, and I wasn't even done. The pixie did exactly what I knew she would do. The words, psionic disintegrate, hadn't left her mouth as I was already laughing. After the DM explained that she no longer had access to those powers, I laughed harder. She spat out the name of some direct damage power, and as I blew apart three of my mirror images, I simply smiled. She turned on her radical invisibility, and I knew that my bloody harvest was almost in its final act. The sorcerer, for once, thinking with a tactical mind, threw a dispel magic at me. I counterspell with my own dispel magic, and I looked for what horrors I had left in my prepared spells. My first order of business was to again call upon my meta magic rods and cast a quickened tree seeing bringing that filthy pixie back into view. A chained and powered split ray, twin ray, often feeblement, lash out, putting both of my deliciously low strength opponents on the floor. A quick jaunt over to the clerk and my boot knife opened her throat. It seemed far more seemingly than a casting of extract water elemental. After all, I took a moment to survey my handiwork. Three turns after I had appeared, a mere 18 seconds of in-game time, the entire party had been neutralised. With an almost shuddering breath, I exhaled and blew out my battle lust. After all, the first stage of my plan was now complete, and the remainder would require a clear head. With something akin to flourish, I opened my huge handy haversack and grasped around for the correct scrolls. Now, let me explain a little bit about necromancers, specifically wizards specialising in necromancy. It is not as many people think the way to a skeleton army. That is for clerics with a narrow selection of domains and a few feats, who are capable of having around 8 times their HD in undead with the correct builds. Neither is it for the creation of undead dragons or similar huge nasty bruisers. It falls solely on the soldiers of the dreaded necromancers, who can do some damn nasty stuff in that department. No, wizard necromancers deal primarily with save or die spells, focusing on the soul, a character's physical attributes, and the always effective fear effects. Strange now that I try to remember it, but there is a medal mentioned in a random splat book that captures the soul of those who die close to it. The name presently escapes me. The joy of the spell tree creation is that it can bring into existence specific materials, and it is with a few of these scrolls that my left hand emerged from my bag, along with a scroll of fabricate. Narrating all the while, I begin to cast these scrolls. A quick casting of animate dead brought the lifeless fighter and cleric back to life to drag their still breathing companions into the now assembled cages. And I commanded the lifeless zombies to slay their former companions as I munched on an apple and a cheese wedge that the cleric had intended to have for her breakfast. The wine was warm, but a quick casting of prestidigitation cooled it to my liking. Throughout the campaign, our DM had allowed me to use the wonderful Souls in Lieu of XP system of item crafting once I had graduated to a high enough level to take advantage of such things. My Ring of Mind Shield had been paid for eternally, with the soul of a rather powerful genie Pasha, and I had made sure to mention this to the parlous survivors of my arcane blitzkrieg. Once all was in readiness, I amble over to our, sorry, my treasure hoard which the others had kindly dragged down into the dining room, and with the help of my raven familiar, selected several of the largest gems, 
another dip into the haversack for the correct scrolls, and my final round of casting for the day began. Trap the soul is a wonderful spell. Thanos. <laughs> <laughs> and it was with this that I captured the very essence of my former companions and erstwhile traitors, ripping their shrieking spirits out of their bodies, a quick casting of disintegrate and a shadow evocation gust of wind to help me clean up. And I was done with plenty of time to spare. I retired to the main gate to read a tome from the Targe library and had my zombies serve me some more wine after they had finished loading all the treasure and all my former companions' equipment into several bags of holding. Going over my inventory, I realised just how much I had tapped from my scroll library and resolved to set to correcting that problem once I returned to my sanctum. The merchant guards arrived as I was finishing the 14th chapter and after a few quick pleasantries, I relinquished control of the tower to them, took the chests of gems and platinum trade bars and bid them all good day. It would take several weeks, but the fighter and the cleric would eventually be revived by friends of theirs. The fighter left a note at the tavern we used to frequent, and it was with some akin to mild embarrassment that I returned his gear to him. The exchange was generally pleasant, and I reimbursed him for the casting of Limited Wish to raise his constitution score to what it used to be. I explained my need to be sure in my victory, and even offered to cut him back on his share of the loot if he wanted to join back up again. He declined, and went off to become a minor lord among the trading roads, where he eventually came to rule a small barony and had a pile of kids as he grew old and fat. The cleric was another matter. Incensed at her death by my hands, she spent the better part of three months trying to find where my sanctum was. She finally gave up when she actually had her greatest success. My sanctum was lined with lead and covered in so many adjuration spells that I couldn't even remember what half of them did. Her attempts at scrying upon me got her nowhere, until I had to make a short jaunt to a major port city for components for the creation of some magical items. She just happened to be scrying at the right time to trigger my scry trap, a wonderful spell that directs a nasty amount of feedback at anyone who tries to scry against you. Specifically, it directs it back at the eyes. That more or less ended her active attempts to track me down for revenge. Although her grudge did eventually shift the views of her church. As she aged, she found herself as a mid-level authority in what had once been a small regional faith with no views on undead and necromancy. Her zeal and force of personality changed that, and now what was once just a small sect is perhaps the biggest sponsor of undead hunting crusaders and slayers on the continent. I occasionally still send her holiday cards just to keep her blood up. <laughs> as for myself, I would eventually achieve lichdom as I felt the icy cold fingers of death catching up with me. By that point, my lair had grown to something that would have made Alucard jealous and the first wave of defences, traps and minions could have stonewalled Pun Pun. I was nothing more than a spell-stitched corpse, bleached bone and two points of light for eyes. I continued my arcane studies for decades, plumbing the depths of the Underdark and the Outer Plains, matching wit and spell with the best of them. The DM ended the campaign with those little afternotes. The session had gone late, and it was around one in the morning. I had work the next day, and I knew I would be miserable, but I couldn't help but chuckle and smile sheepishly at everyone else at the table. Their looks were all somewhere between blind fury, mild amusement, and confusion as if they really couldn't believe that dozens of sessions and hundreds of hours had ended in this. I opened another bottle of water and pulled a half a dozen character sheets from my bag, fresh and crisp except for the line of players' names, where I had taken the liberty to jot down the names of everyone at the table. I was pretty surprised when most people said that yes, they were very interested in what my campaign would be. 